uh, lecture by a distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor Wadia Edward Said. Uh, professor Said uh, is a professor of law at the University of South California. He's a graduate of Columbia and Princeton universities with several scientific awards. He has published extensively in international law, political asylum, and human rights. He is the author of Crimes of Terror, The Legal and Political Implications of Federal Terrorism Prosecution, Oxford University Press in 2015. His talk today would be on legal classifications and, the, and their global impact understanding the American, the, uh, the American notions of, uh, of terrorism. Please welcome with me, Professor Sam. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much uh, to AUC for having me here. You know, this is a, for me, it's a very, Obviously, a great honor just not to be here under the sort of general aegis of the Edward Said lecture, but also um, to speak at AUC where I was a student 25 years ago. So uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's uh, it's really great to be here. And I mean, the CASA program was exceedingly, exceedingly formative in my in my outlook and in providing me with a great deal of you know not just skill in the Arabic language, but also kind of the confidence to tackle the issues that I do, as you hopefully will maybe hear about. And I was very happy to see um, that I, my old teacher, Aza Wakir, was here, who insisted that I learn the Egyptian dialect, which I, of course, was uh, very insistent that I not learn, because I had a different dialect that I learned at home. Um, but she insisted that I do that. So I want to thank her very much. She also gave us, I said this the other day, but I want to repeat it just because it's so such an important sentiment, you know, when our, the students would complain about an 8 a.m. class and speaking Arabic so early in the morning, she'd say, what do you mean? The Egyptians speak Arabic at all hours of the day. You know, what, why is this so special, right? And it's an amazing point because in the United States, and this is, uh, you'd be surprised, but this is going to have some impact on what I'll say about terrorism classifications, terrorism prosecutions more generally. The idea that Arabic is somehow an impenetrable language has kind of, you know, has, uh, has uh, unfortunately become like a trope or a, or a kind of accepted conventional wisdom. I don't think that's necessarily true, or it shouldn't be true. It shouldn't be true. So I wanted to, to make sure to, you know, to mark for me the specialness of this occasion, uh, both, you know, for, at the Edward Said connection but also uh, for my own personal, my own personal experience as well. And what I'll try to do here is talk a little bit about my own work in having transitioned from my work as a federal public defender, where I was engaged in defending individuals charged in terrorism cases in America. And again, I want to try to draw out some of the distinctions. Here in Egypt, it's, it's uh, I think, obviously a little bit of a different view, a different point of view. So uh, I want to make sure that, that you know, we, we, we understand some of these distinctions in the American context, but also as they apply, also as they apply in the, in the Egyptian context. Because in the United States, terrorism prosecutions are a entirely fe federal phenomenon, meaning they're tried in federal courts as opposed to in the state courts. And they raise issues of bias that are endemic uh, also in ordinary criminal prosecutions, but they also exhibit biases that are specific to what the federal government con considers to be the terrorist enemy, namely violent Islamist groups. And that doesn't mean what it means in Egypt. It, it, it means something different in the United States context. Um, and interestingly, you see fake state and local law enforcement kind of play a role as well. They have something called a Joint Terrorism Task Force, or a JTTF. In America, everyone is just going completely bonkers using acronyms for everything. But I'll try to stay. I'll try to stay away from that. Away from that. I want to note a couple of things before I talk about classifications, if I could. Three things that are 
kind of particular to a terrorism prosecution. Uh, one is they're designed to be prevented. Okay, after the September 11, 2001 attack, uh, the Attorney General John Ashcroft at the time noted that the Department of Justice is going to shift okay, from a policy of what it called punitive approach. That is to say, there's been an attack, there's been a violent incident, now we need to have a prosecution, okay, punish those who carried out an attack. That approach has to shift to a preventive one. Stop attacks before they occur. Okay? Now, here the issue of bias comes up because if you believe a person, because of their race or religion, in this case, is more predisposed to be a terrorist, innocent, what is basically innocent activity can be viewed as more sinister. So, for example, in the United States, if there's a group of Muslims getting together and going to play paintball, all the federal agencies are going to lose their mind and start tracking them. Okay? So there's the preventive focus, that's one. Number two is they are undergirded, undergirded by a unique statute. Okay? 18 in the, I hate to do this to you, but I will. 18 United States Code Section 2339B, the ban on providing material support to designated foreign terrorist organizations, also known as FTOs. Now I'm going to discuss this in detail in a moment, because that's the, that's the basis of the classification and classification regime that we're going to we're going to look at, or I'm going to try to talk about. This is the most utilized statute in terrorism prosecutions, and it criminalizes support. Okay, which is something unique in the criminal law. And so, forgive me a little bit of a technical point. In the criminal law, there's the substantive crime, you know, like murder or robbery or whatever it is. But then someone can be also charged as what is known as an accessory, someone who helps or aids and abets. Okay, but it's a supportive role and it's seen not as serious or not as dangerous. The, one of the unique things about the statute, the ban on providing material support to an FTO, is that the support is the crime. So this is a kind of uh, a legal innovation that you don't often see. And it also tells you that in the government's view, the United States government's view, supporting terrorism is viewed as so bad that it needs a new doctrinal category in the law. Number three, the enemy is foreign, according to the government, not domestic. Okay? And I'll talk about this again coming up as well. The idea is that there is a list of foreign terrorist organizations. There is no list of domestic terrorist organizations. Okay? That's, also, that's also important because it means that this law providing material support can be applied can be applied only to people who aid foreign groups, not domestic groups. Now, uh, to understand these, what I might call discriminatory dynamics that underlie terrorism prosecutions, let's look at who the government calls the terrorist enemy and how these designations are arrived at. And this is, the, the, just to be, just to be kind of, uh, give you a little bit of background, so my book on terrorism prosecutions came out in 2015, and then I updated it for 2018 with a new, a new preface. So I said these remarks, or I made these remarks in other contexts, and, and, but I think what I've tried to do is stay on top of what are the kind of critical developments uh, to to continue to comment on the relevance of of these statutes and these practices. And the book looked at the entirety of a terrorism prosecution, which is a criminal prosecution. It's a federal criminal prosecution. So the legal structure is the same, but it has, it has a kind of a few distinguishing features, which is in any instance where there might be protection for a criminal defendant, well, there's a kind of a terrorist exception. Okay, there's a kind of a terrorist exception. And it's in that context we look at the, the list of groups designated as FTOs. They're designated by the Secretary of State in this era himself. Okay, the Secretary of State makes these designations. Um, and as a result of this list, anyone who provides what has come to be known as material support to an FTO can be prosecuted and if found guilty, sentenced up to 20 years in federal prison. 
The United States Congress's motivation in passing this law in 1996, so before the September 11th attacks, uh, was to basically counteract what it characterized as the persistent problem of terrorist groups raising money in the United States under the cover of humanitarian or charitable activity. Now the thing that's interesting about this is that, is that Congress believed this was a real problem. Having studied this issue for many, many years, I'm not convinced that there was a plague of terrorist groups in the United States raising money for charitable activity and then funneling it towards violence. I, I'm not convinced of it, but uh, I lost on, you know, I, my position is losing one on that issue as it is on many others, but I continue in my, I'll continue in my remarks. Material support doesn't simply mean money or weapons, however. It can encompass more nebulous concepts such as services, expertise, and personnel. Okay, so you can give yourself as material support to a terrorist organization, uh, as, the, as the thinking goes. This includes now, in a case in 2010 decided by the United States Supreme Court, protected speech. So there was a case involving individuals, American citizens, who wanted to help two groups that were banned. One was the Kurdistan Workers' Party, also known as the PKK, and the other was known as the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, also known as the Tamil Tigers. Uh, so outside of, you know, our more conventional, outside our more conventional kind of Arab world, Middle Eastern context, PKK sort of, but not, not quite. What these individuals wanted to do was help the groups they mentioned, the LTTE and the PKK, advocate for themselves peacefully, not use violence, advocate for their cause peacefully, learn how to lobby the United Nations, the US Congress, teach them how to engage in more peaceful means. The United States Supreme Court said they could be prosecuted for violating the material support law, even though that would be protected speech. Uh, uh, if not otherwise connected to an FTO. So this was a big moment in the, in the, in the, in the criminal, uh, in, the, in the development and finding this law to be constitutionally acceptable in the United States. Okay. <coughs> now, let's look at, if we could, who is on this FTO list. So currently, there are 68 groups designated as FTOs, 55 of which are either Muslim in makeup or explicitly Islamist in ideology, with 44 of those 47 groups designated since the 9-11 attacks enjoying those same characteristics. In fact, the last 32 groups that have been designated are explicitly Islamist organizations. We have to go back over 10 years to May 2009 to find the last time a non-Islamist FTO was designated. That was the Greek organization called Revolutionary Struggle. Um, so according to officialdom in the United States, the quintessential terrorist is Muslim, professing to be an Islamist or jihadist. As the, in the United States, there's a lot of, um, you may have heard the phrase, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But you see, you see many official actors use the term jihadist, which um, I don't know where they got that. But he, this is why this is an issue, okay? So, for example, for example, the last group designated was the Islam, is the Iranian Republican Guard Corps, okay? Now, we can all, we can have whatever position we like about Iran, and that's fine. I'm not here to argue the merits. I'm trying to look at it from a perspective of this is an organization that's part of a sovereign state. All the groups on this list so far have been what are called non-state actors. They're not part of any government. Okay? Here we see, here we see the government take a step to put a government, another government's official organization on a terrorist list. Precedentially, that's that's a little bit of a dangerous step because it now means that the United States has signed off on kind of piercing the veil, or uh, if you would, of sovereignty. Okay, state sovereignty now is up for grabs and up for sort of up for debate, not up for grabs, up for debate. This is a legal innovation whose ramifications I don't know the government has fully 
consider. Okay, the next issue is the idea of uh, the, that it hasn't happened yet. It may never happen, but it's obviously an important point here in Egypt uh, and the rest of the Middle East is putting the, the Muslim Brotherhood on the terrorist organization list, declaring it a foreign terrorist organization. Now, here's the thing, and I'll try to talk about this now coming up, the idea of Islamophobia in the United States and, and other so-called Western countries. But let's be clear, the ability to distinguish that you have in Egypt, you don't have it in the United States, okay? So the ramifications of crossing the line between what is Islamist and what is Islam is pretty, is pretty nebulous in the American context, right? So these are, you know, these are progressions or developments we follow. I, I feel we must follow with caution because of what they say about this whole region, okay? And people of Arab and Muslim origin in a greater sense. So I think we need to, we need to make sure that we, we understand that. It's not simply an issue that you would understand or understand the nuances of a little more, a little better like you would here in Egypt or in other parts of the Middle East. Because to rely on the construct of the terrorist as Muslim operating in his guise as an Islamist or jihadist, it requires the perpetuation of a hostile ideology, which we now commonly refer to as Islamophobia. And because I'm here also having given the Edward Said lecture, I do have to, of course, uh, you know, officially recognize my father's own work, particularly a book he wrote called Covering Islam. He talks about how the media portrays the Islamic world. Uh, and, you know, if you basically took that book, which was, it first came out in 1981, if you took that book and you changed the names and the dates uh, to update it, you know, to current modern times, it'd be the same points. Not much has changed. All right. Basically, the construction of the terrorist as Muslim hinges on rendering Islam in all its divergent strains, beliefs, communities, and cultures, spanning well over a billion people worldwide, as a deviant faith that is not compatible with the modern notions of a liberal, of a liberal democracy. Okay? If you think that I'm exaggerating, I mean, you know, you, I would suggest you, you know, try to follow some of this discussion in the United States. There's a a, a network of scholarly papers that people can kind of make their paper, can, can post their work to uh, freely called the Social Science Research Network, and I've signed up for several of its you know, of its um, of its uh, periodicals. It collects articles that people post under subject matter headings and then sends them out, and I'm subscribed to maybe a dozen or, or, or fifteen of them. And once one of them published an article by a guy basically saying that Islam is incompatible with democracy, okay, and that Islam shouldn't be treated as a religion under the United States Constitution, more like a kind of, more like a, a belief system or a system of governance that shouldn't enjoy the protections of the United States Constitution and freedom of religion. I, I hate to, you know, I hate to, you know, kind of be alarmist, and I, I don't think this represents mainstream thinking but these ideas are given a home in, 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 in more than more than one forum, in more than one forum in the United States, and I think we need to be very I think we need to be very cautious about that because when we operate from these premises, it's easy to view anyone affiliated with Islam as part and parcel of a terrorist threat to the established liberal order. In the terrorism con prosecution context. The Islamophobic gaze has law enforcement viewing Muslims as particularly susceptible to being, and this is their term, not mine, radicalized. Right? When you hear that word radicalized or radicalization, you, you know what they're talking about, okay? Meaning that the next step is they turn into violent extremists in ways in which the average non-Muslim can't sort of radicalize or be a violent extremist. Okay, there's even a program sponsored by the executive branch of the United States government called Countering Violent Extremism. And it doesn't say anything about Islam, but there are clues in there. You have to read it carefully, and then you understand. Uh, then you understand what they're talking about. The problem is 
actual police work and investigatory activity can't be rendered into checklists and shorthanded codes that operate like formulas. Um, when the FBI's theory of radicalization basically purports to guide law enforcement in figuring out when a Muslim might turn into a terrorist. Okay? In its official guide on the topic, FBI agents are instructed to consider things like increased religiosity and note things like if someone starts wearing traditional garb or growing a beard as markers on the road to violence. This is what I would refer to as a factual a kind of jump science um, that under that kind of imbues the radicalization theory, but it hasn't stopped it from gaining currency with the government on a more or less bipartisan basis, Democrats and Republicans. On this note, what about countering violent extremism? That also frames the terrorist threat as quintessentially Muslim. And countering that extremism requires the assistance of society at large, which is now enlisted in surveillance of the target community at home, work, school, and leisure. To compound the message, the authorities ask the Muslim American community to join them in policing and surveilling their own communities as part of countering violent extremism. Uh, this is, by the way, a, a kind of an updated version of what you saw, for example, the drug uh, enforcement agency use in creating a so-called drug courier profile. Right? They would say, okay, someone's traveling in an airport, they bought a one-way ticket drug courier. Someone's traveling in an airport, they bought a round trip ticket, drug courier. It's literally that nonsensical, and it's been kind of imported into the, uh, into the uh, terrorism prosecution realm. And this phenomenon of regarding Muslims writ large with deep suspicion is not limited to the criminal terrorism prosecution. Uh, consider that, despite the twists and turns throughout its first year of existence, and now its second year, I guess, the proposed travel ban on immigrants from certain Muslim-majority countries was, when it was proposed, I mean, envisioned by its proponent, now the President of the United States, as a block on any Muslim coming to the country from abroad. And the Supreme Court, you might remember, in 2018, recognized the constitutionality of the travel ban in light of the nearly unreviewable power of immigration enjoyed by the political branches of government. Uh, the implications of its out-and-out -out plain hostility to Islam, which is perceived as a threat in and of itself, is troubling and profound. So don't expect help from the United States Supreme Court on this. The communities and activists have to advocate for themselves. We do see some rays of hope in the lower courts of the United States. For example, there was recently a case of a lower federal court that found that the watch list that the FBI used was just too broad put people on it uh, without, many, without much discretion, and the court said that was unconstitutional. The problem is, the problem is, what we have seen now is uh, that we have a whole system based on these concepts. So how are these prosecutions driven? Uh, they're driven by informants, secret informants. So the government basically has, and they've defended this quite stringently, a policy of sending out informants into communities. Now, in a normal investigation, police don't usually act unless they have some sort of evidence to go on. But when you look at the informants in these terrorism prosecutions, they just go to the local mosque and just sort of listen, okay? And then if the more aggressive of them start going around to the young people or people around the Islamic community, Muslim community, and start saying, hey, I'm really thinking about engaging in some activity. Would you want to join me? And they offer money, okay? So we've seen many prosecutions in which some sad sack individuals have been offered money. Um, and they decide, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll of course, uh, be happy to join your plot to blow up whatever. Um, and it's, of course, very hard to argue someone agrees to engage in violent activity that they were innocent to begin with, but the tactics the informants use are quite manipulative. The lure of money, they all, a lot of times, the defendants will say, we were never going to do anything. We just wanted to swindle the guy for the money. He seemed to have money.
That also doesn't seem to be that kind of convincing or, or effective an approach of, of countering danger to kind of going, kind of not just look for it, but actually play a role in creating it. In one of these cases, the federal judge reviewing the issue said, this plot would not have existed without the government, okay, without the government intervention. This wouldn't have happened had it not been for the government intervention. And that's unfortunately a lot of what we're seeing in the United States. Okay. Uh, I want to see if I can conclude here with a, a couple of um, a couple of points here. A couple of points. Um, let's look at this. This is hopefully relevant to some of the things I used to study here. All right. From my own experience, I'd like us to kind of consider what it looks like to see the government render a series of accusations into formal charges and then prosecute. So let's consider the issue of translation. Okay? FBI agents frequently use translators to help them. They don't know Arabic, right? Or they have the language under consideration, whatever it might be, Farsi, Urdu, etc. They use translators. Those translators are not generally speaking FBI agents or employees. They're independent contractors. Uh, so their employment is, on, is dependent on meeting the favor of the agents themselves. Uh, and the issue of understanding versus a simple, accurate rendering of a translation are never a factor in the law. I've uh, mentioned this before, but basically, the, uh, for example, in one case when I was uh, very young and uh, just out of law school, I helped some lawyers with a case involving the issue of the Miranda warnings. Now, the police in the United States, when they arrest someone, they're supposed to tell them they have a right to remain silent and a right to an attorney. But they can also waive the rights if they'd like to and talk to the police. Of course, as a criminal defense lawyer, you always say, never talk to the police without a lawyer. But um, The issue was if the FBI agents had rendered the Miranda warnings properly into Arabic uh, for the purposes of an Arabic-speaking subject. Um, this was in a case involving a, 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 an incident abroad, a bombing abroad. So I went to the kid to the courthouse and I heard the, the FBI translator uh, basically give his testimony. And the language was fine. There was no problem with the translation. But I then went to the lawyers and I said, look, but there's no way this individual would understand what Miranda warnings mean. He's coming from a country where he's never been told he has a right to silence or a right to an attorney. Can't we do something about that? And they just laughed at me and said, oh, yeah. You're so young and innocent. Of course you can't do anything about that. The law is predicated on that. That's how it works in the American context. So the issue of translation and understanding as opposed to just a, a, a literal translation, the point is made. The government also relies on expert witnesses who have an agenda, okay, who are very, very biased um, and seem to also view, also view these defendants as a, as a great threat. Um, and I can talk about that more if there are questions because I don't want to take too much time here. Finally, the FBI suffers from a huge problem of how to deal with Muslim Americans. I don't know that this has changed much because my citation is a little bit old, but bear with me. In 2008, there was an article in the New York Times that basically said half of the FBI thinks that they should work with the local Muslim communities, okay, for a whole host of reasons. The other half of the FBI, this is an estimate, views Islam as a suspect religion and that the community should be treated as a hostile community, okay, which is kind of staggering if you think about it, right? In addition, in a prosecution in 2007, 2008, the the government declared a group called the Council on American Islamic Relations CARE an unindicted co conspirator in a terrorism prosecution. An unindicted co conspirator means they're not facing charges, but, uh, but it also means that the FBI can't work with CARE. Now, CARE is the largest Muslim American advocacy group, 
So the message is clear. The message is clear about the fact that the government refuses to deal with the official kind of or the most prominent representative groups of Muslims in the United States. I want to sort of finish up because this is something new that I that I've been kind of mulling over. You probably read in the news. Um, you probably read in the news two different things. Okay. The first relates to foreign policy. The second relates to second relates to do, to um, to domestic policy. Okay. Regarding foreign policy, the problem with all of this is that designations sections of terrorism are all within the government's power, right? The way the Constitution works and the privileges and powers that the executive branch enjoys, it means that ordinary citizens, citizen groups, can't influence how these, can't officially go to court to call for a change in terrorism designations. So there was a, a, a case that considered this issue because how does a group get on a list? It gets on a list because it's one foreign, two engages in terrorism or terrorist activity. There's a broad definition of that. And three, that violence harms the nationals of the United States or United States national security, which is defined not as you know, attacking the United States, but also the foreign interest relations of the United States. So, that's not something that can be challenged in court. There was an Iranian group which finally got off the list through a, a lobbying campaign. But they went to court many times and they could never get off the list. And their main argument was, we're fighting the Iranian government. We like the United States. Please take us off this list. Our enemy is your enemy. They never got anywhere because that, that power is reserved for the federal government. It's not something that courts are going to get involved in, the executive branch of the federal government. So we need to be aware of that. And what that means is, for example, look at what we recently saw in Syria, okay, with the Turkish invasion of Syria, because they are threatened by the Kurdish groups there that were operating. Those Kurdish groups are the Syrian version of the PKK, which has been on the terrorist organization list since 1997 when it first came out. By the way, Al Qaeda didn't get on it until 1999. So, in that, in that, in that construct. You know, we have a weird situation where the government was, for so long, the American government, the American military, was working with a group that was basically a, a brother or sister organization to, a, to an FTO that had been there for 20 plus years. And then all of a sudden, when the Turks were you know, invaded, I don't know the circumstances, I'm not going to speculate about all that, they said, we're fighting we're fighting basically an extension of the PKK, who are well-known terrorists. The point here is that the government construes these things according to its own interests. PKK is only on the list because Turkey is an important ally of the United States. Okay? Issues of the justness of the cause and uh, whether groups or minorities or peoples are oppressed, or, that's not part of the discussion. It's not allowed to be part of the discussion. So it's important to note that. And you see that this is something that the, 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 the executive branch holds very closely. It's a power it, 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 it enjoys under the Constitution, and it's not going to be questioned. Which leads to a lot of which leads to a lot of questions as there is no internationally agreed upon definition of terrorism. It's a lot of I know it when I see it, um, terrorism in the eye of the beholder. Uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. All these issues that kind of came to the fore in the 70s with the struggles uh, that you saw in Ireland, uh, South Africa, Palestine, they haven't gone away. They've just kind of been swept up in this bigger debate over terrorism. So that's one point to make, that it's very, very fluid in terms of the classification. Uh, finally, you may have noticed if you follow the news in the United States about all these mass shootings that have taken place, right? And then there's been a call to call them domestic terrorism, okay? And we know there isn't a domestic terrorist organization list. And I myself, on the one hand, I don't minimize the seriousness of these issues. 
and I don't minimize the seriousness of you know, certain threats within the United States. In fact, you know, I, I think that in many ways they're more serious than some of the situations I've talked about here or groups I've talked about here. But all the research seems to say that it's because there are just too many guns in the United States, too many uh, military assault weapons available for civilian use, right? And the problem with that is there's a, something in the Constitution called the Second Amendment which guarantees the right to bear arms. And the Supreme Court of the United States in a series of decisions has said, has basically invalidated regulating the right to bear arms. In fact, there's an even more interesting thing, I guess you might say. There's a trend now to, among certain people with certain views, to argue that the Second Amendment is being treated as a sort of, uh, as a lesser constitutional right in the Bill of Rights, and that it should be given more, more protection, not less. Meaning, the ability to own guns should be even more open than it already is. And that's, a, that's something to be quite compelling to some of the more conservative justices on the Supreme Court. So, I guess I would conclude by saying that the legal, I hate to depress everyone, because this, this, this is clearly a depressing subject. The happy can kind of note on which to conclude is what we've seen to combat these sort of official structures and, and constructs and legislation and prosecutions has been when communities have worked together and gotten behind defendants, advocated against the passage of certain laws, they've had some success. Okay? They've been able to mitigate some of the hard edges of this legal regime that I'm talking about. Okay? And so that, that is kind of the, the, the silver lining here on this mostly dark cloud that I'm describing. And I, I don't think we should lose sight of that because I think as time progresses, a lot of these official constructs and, and legislative structures and, 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 and kind of law enforcement stances are, forced, are being forced to be re reconsidered or the people are forcing them by their own advocacy to reconsider them. So I might end on that slightly happier note and I'd be happy to hear from anyone with any questions or any comments. Thank you very much.
you. So the first question is related to an article that should be coming out, that I have coming out like in the next month or so. And the second question is related to an article that should be coming out next year. So I am, I am, I am thinking about these issues. So I think the, the issue of, you know, of kind of these classifications more generally and their historical kind of lineage, for sure. Absolutely. I think what you saw was two things. One is, you know, this, 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 this uh, current regime builds on things like blacklisted communists that we saw in the McCarthy era, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting kind of uh, you know, historic, historical link. And you've seen some of the cases from that era where the Supreme Court made a distinction between, you know, between status, which can't be criminalized. So you can be a member of the Communist Party, but conduct where you can't really, you know, you can't really do anything. And there was some confusion because in those cases, they basically said that ordinary rank and file members can't be prosecuted criminally, whereas you had to be kind of an active leader. And so we litigated this issue in the material support cases because we tried to argue that there should be a specific intent requirement that for someone to give material support, they have to specifically intend to further the illegal goals of the group of the FTO, not the peaceful goals or, or non-violent goals. And the Supreme Court said, no, that the answer is that as long as you know what you're giving is material support, and as long as you know that you're giving it to an FTO, it doesn't matter what your purpose was. So that's another thing. It's had a big effect on Muslims, you know, giving for, I mean, there's a zakat requirement, right, in Islam, you know, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. You know, now the problem is you can't pick and choose where you give your zakat, even if you have a valid basis for doing, a valid humanitarian basis for doing so. So this is a big development. Um, and it builds on that lineage. And also, it, on the sort of anti-communist uh, kind of lineage, it also builds on uh, this, there was a kind of a, you know, a movement to get law enforcement to be more preventive in a general context, you know, with ordinary crimes. You probably have seen the movie, did you ever see the movie Minority Report, right? So that thinking existed before the 9-11 attacks and before, and before there was a focus on terrorism. And this is terrorism like with the use of informants, like with um, certain other developments, has served as a basis to establish these new exceptions. It's very convenient um, because the enemy is so easily vilified that you can get all these legal limitations. So those are the two kind of points there. The second one about the, the, the UN regime, what I was, was writing about was how, you know, the, the UN regime, what I'm going to be writing about in, you know, for an upcoming article that I've already talked about in sort of a draft phase, is just how the UN regime both on the, on the, on the, in the Security Council, but also now it's part, it's like an actual secretariat in the UN, a counterterrorism secretariat, has basically adopted the American mindset. Now they've only applied it to basically, you know, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic, so-called Islamic State, but, um, but the, the model is there for telling the world what the danger is, you know, and, you know, other governments love it. Remember, and this has been true since the, after 9-11 when George Bush, you know, met with Putin. Putin loved what he was doing because it allowed him at that time to crack down on, uh, on, on activity uh, in Chechnya, right? So governments around the world love this, especially ones who want to characterize their enemy as Islamists. But they, we're not, I don't think, appreciating what that means for Islam. And that's why I say here in Egypt, you know, I understand the background and the history recent history regarding the Muslim Brotherhood, but it has a bit more of a ramification than I think we're credited, okay, than I think we're credited. And then, um, you know, uh, the, the, the final kind of, the, the final discussion, just to remind me, because I was so fixated on the first one. How would the process okay. So basically, this is, yes, thank you, I'm glad you, because I remember there was something I wanted to mention about my more recent article that's going to come out soon, which is basically, it's, 
I mean, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, in the United States, people get very, very touchy. You went to a foreign country and we criticized the United States. I'm not talking about myself as like a big figure. It could be anybody, right? It could be anybody, big or small. So I want to be careful how I phrase this, but I think we need to recognize that law enforcement agencies are, you know, I think it's not unfair to say they're looking for ways in which they might increase their power and then their ability to do things. Sometimes it's legitimate, sometimes maybe less so. So the terrorism hook, you might call it, has served as a basis for a, you know, greater discretion, greater powers in other law enforcement contexts. So the two that I talk about are just sort of ordinary criminal, you know, um, ordinary criminal activity like policing of drug crimes and things like that. Um, and also immigration uh, enforcement, where you've seen immigration authorities kind of also take some of these powers and uh, use them in a, in, a, in a broader context, drawing on the same logic. So we're seeing it also across the board for sure. So thank you very much. Uh, Imam Ali, one of the famous Muslim figures, said, Islam cannot utter, it's merely a text. But people who utter by it, who are spoken by Islam. So you cannot never separate between Islam as a religion and Muslims. It is a mechanism and justification for people who want to put makeup to Islam. Look at Iran. All the militia, or most of the militia. It's, how did they uh, be like this? By the Iranian regime. Why America was silent all these years for Iranian regime, which ruled by Islam? There is a, a, a woman, a young lady called Jasmine, prisoned for 15 years because what the adversaries of Iran unveiled. Only, only she was the unveiled in the streets of Iran. She prisoned for 15 years. And the women in Iran were prevented to attend the mansions unless the FIFA urged the regime to let them uh, attend the FIFA uh, mansion. Also in uh, Saudi Arabia, all people ruled by Islam here, the, the, first, the beginning of the point, the, be, the beginning of the dilemma, that people ruled by the religion, and there are many people oppressed, they, uh, and uh, pre, uh, there are a lot of uh, oppression and deprivation by the name of Islam. I mean, uh, women deprived from the main uh, uh, rights. It's the question they, uh, is the question. Yes. Why America waited all these long times until the, they threatened in the home, the threat comes to here, and they don't take any steps toward the Muslim uh, regimes in the uh, Middle East, like Iran and Saudi Arabia, sure. Okay, uh, okay, well, thank you for that, uh, for that comment and question. I mean, that's not true. Iran has been uh, on, so in the United States, the, there's a special me mechanism for, you know, for denying the state, a, a, a country, the protections of sovereignty. Uh, it's called uh, it's it's called the state sponsor of terrorism designation. Iran has been a state sponsor of terrorism in the United States since the list existed. So since the revolution, the Iranian regime has been treated as a kind of a terrorist regime. So that's not true that America hasn't um, hasn't. Uh, paid attention to that, has paid attention to it for since the time of the revolution. So Iran has been basically a hostile regime. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. The second point is, you know, without getting into the geopolitics, you know, the politics of Saudi Arabia, the United States alliances, etc., which we could all spend many, many days talking about and probably criticizing, etc. I think the key thing is the danger with this legal regime basically hinting at, if not outright saying, Muslims are, you know, sort of not capable of existing in modern civilization 
because of their religion, and, and they kind of have to either be changed totally uh, to practice an Islam that sort of the West deems agreeable, or they live in a kind of a in a zone where they're sort of not on the same level. I, and I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's a bit of valid justification, a valid classification. Uh, I, and I don't think that. I think that the world will basically, even though as, it's, as, we're, close, as we're slowly but surely destroying it ourselves with the climate change type stuff, but it will, we'll destroy it even faster if we start commenting on others' belief systems, right, as fundamentally incapable of democracy or, or things like that. So the legal regime here, I worry, gets a little too close to making those types of value judgments about a religion of over a billion people. Right? Who, I mean, with my respect to, you know, the, uh, I wanted to say that uh, um, when I was here at Casa, I was just talking to Dean uh, Zayn Taha about this. When I was at Casa, we had a class on the interpretation of the Quran, which we, the students, had asked for, and the, the administration had gotten us a teacher. And I went to her and I said, you know, he told us that there are these two interpretations for when a woman should wear a hijab. And it's Ibn Kathir and Sayyid Qutb, and that's the only two positions. And she said to me, she said, and I hope I don't mind if I, if, you say, if I say this, but she basically said to me, that's absolutely not the case. There are many more interpretations, right? And, and, and it really opened my eyes to the idea, because in the United States, I once had a student come to me and said, and said, I want to write a paper, this is why I got out of the business of final papers in my human rights course, right? It's because I had a student come to me and she said, I want to write about Islam. Okay, I said, what do you mean by that? She said, I want to write about how people are bound to, 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 to certain strictures in Islam. And I said, oh, what do you mean by that? She said, well, I have an Iraqi friend. And she says, what's in the Quran you have to do? I said, please don't write that. She did, and it became a big headache. And I, because I said, well, read some different thinkers, read some, read, you know, I said at the time, I said, you know, read people who think a little bit differently. Read Abdullah al for example. She didn't. And it was a, you know, it was a, I didn't enjoy that at all. And so I want to stay away from things like such and such figure says Islam is this and we have to stick with it. Because I don't think a billion plus people think, all think the same way. Okay. We have one last yeah. question you I'm going to keep it brief because we don't have much time. Um, so as a lawyer speaking uh, primarily to a student and non-lawyer audience, um, it was very gratifying for you to talk about advocacy and changing what you called um, the legal regime, softening its hard edges. Um, where does advocacy work, in particular in a democratic system where decision making is heavily influenced by public opinion? So have you considered arguments um, like that of Vanessa Barr or James Whitman, who talk about the American penal regime as specifically dependent upon our open to public opinion, and therefore harsher than regimes where elite level decisions are made, um, partitioned off uh, from public opinion, which may be either ignorant uh, or harsh. And you know, just to finish, um, when thinking about uh, whether advocacy um, will work and how it will work, Maybe things like talking about status versus contract, which can be very powerful and fairly simple, looking back on um, the Smith Act and Dennis and Yates, et cetera, or even just slavery, et cetera. That may be a, a powerful form of that. Okay, yeah, so I'm assuming you're a lawyer. Uh, political science. Political science, okay, all right, yeah. The Smith Act and the United States be Dennis, okay, those. Okay, so I mean, I appreciate very much the question, I mean, I think it works in kind of interesting ways. I think, you know, lobbying for legislation and things like that, I think that is a tougher one because it's very hard to get the average person who's concerned about, for example, you know, the fact that health insurance is a nightmare in the United States and unemployment and their precarious existence to care about things like anti terrorism policy because it's probably not going to affect them. And, you know, while Muslims are a growing, a growing minority in the United States, there's still only, you know, six or seven million in the population of 330 million or something like that. So to get the average American to really focus on this might be a stretch. 
but where the advocacy really does come into effect, and also to get Congress people to listen, you know, is also a little bit, I think, I don't say it's not worth it, but I don't know that we can expect much. But what you see in a lot of these prosecutions is, you know, I mean, the criminal justice system, based into the, the, the commentary you were citing earlier, you know, the scholars you were citing earlier, you know, uh, criminal defendants basically, uh, you know, are left to their fate because there's nobody really there to help them or advocate for them, their community, their families, their, et cetera. I mean, being indigent is a, you know, is a deep, deep, deep uh, problem for someone facing charges criminally. And what you've seen in the terrorism cases has been a lot of times where individuals face charges and they have community support and the community shows up, it does make a difference in those prosecutions. I mean, so I'm less sort of knowledgeable or understanding of advocacy writ large about legislation and its efficacy, but I do, I have seen that when the community shows up to support of a certain person who's charged, it can make a difference for sure. So that's what I was, you know, really thinking about there. Classes are going to start soon. We have, can we can take two very quick questions? There's one over there. So my question is back to the advocacy and pressure that we have there. Uh, we, were, we were talking about the uh, gun control and Second Amendment groups. So I'm just, again, how, how effective are these groups? Like you said that sometimes they're successful, but in the example you were giving with the Second Amendment groups that are you know, we have groups like the NRA that are spending millions lobbying people in Congress and funding politicians to like, you know, um, make any common sense reform and gun control, you know, happen. So, so you know, how do these groups ever have a chance, you know, when they're faced with these other advocacy groups that are obviously, you know, doing all they can to stop any sort of effort from well, definitely. I mean, I think going back to the earlier question you know, about the, the, the difficulty of the larger scale advocacy. I mean, you know, the NRA is obviously a very powerful advocacy group, lobby group, and they thwart a lot of gun control regulation to the point where legislators don't even, legislators don't even propose any new law, which is obviously a deep problem that's affecting the United States. And people are, you know, that's an issue where people are out on the streets. You saw in the wake of the Parkland shootings in Florida, you know, the students themselves advocated that some of them became quite famous for their, you know, their willingness to kind of advocate and confront, um, you know, their representatives. And that might change for sure. The thing that makes me a little bit nervous is you have justices on the Supreme Court who have openly said the Second Amendment is being treated as a secondary right and it should enjoy the same protections as the other rights in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the United States Constitution. And there's a, so, you know, how popular that view is, I don't know. I would presume it's maybe not that popular, but because it's held by people who are in a very influential position, you know, and the issue of federal judges in the United States and their kind of leanings has been a huge issue since the early 80s, um, when kind of ideological litmus tests were being offered for under encoded language or who gets to be a judge. So it's a very tricky issue where I think popular will is being thwarted to a fair degree, not just by the lobbying groups, but also by the way the federal judiciary works. So the only, I think the only solution is going to be continued agitation, but it will be, I think, a tricky road, a tricky road. Thank you. Uh, very Okay, how do they come to this 55 list of terrorist groups? I presume that the legal sector of the United States is separate from the executive and from the legislative, so that the president cannot tell them, put the Iranian Republic in guards. No, this is, it, the list is made by the executive branch, by the Secretary oh, really? of State. Yeah, yeah. Wow, what so about the separation of Well, it's an, it's an executive, it's an, Basically, the courts have long recognized under the Constitution that foreign affairs is under the purview of the executive branch. It's not a, it's, it's something, it's, there's a, the, the way that it's phrased is that 
um, that political issues are non-justiciable, right? So the political doctrine, the political affairs doctrine, right? If it's a political affair, it's not for the courts. So this is deemed not for the courts. So when you have a case where someone is charged with providing material support, challenging the designation is not allowed. So for example, when I was defending someone who was charged with uh, providing material support to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, we couldn't say the group shouldn't be on the list. Well, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. Not that we probably would have done that, to be honest with you, just to give you a window into legal strategy. But you could. You can. So that's how it works. But the executive, when they decide on something, I mean, how do they decide? Do they do research? Do they look into things? Is there a a committee or something that will help them decide? Presumably, or it's just the president decides that okay, Presumably the Secretary of State has offices within the Department of State that do this in conjunction with the Department of Justice and the Department of the Treasury, but it's a secret process. A group doesn't learn they're about to be designated. They learn that they've been designated because they don't want the group, if it has assets in the United States, taking them away. Sounds like accreditation of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks again.